Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for our March virtual book party. We are excited to share some of our recent favorites with you. Uh, we will start by introducing our book talkers this evening. My name is Catherine. I am one of the teen services librarians. My name is Allison Corcoran. I'm an adult advisory librarian. My name is Lauren Reed. I'm one of the teen services librarians. And like Allison, I'm Pamela and one of the adult services librarians. And I'm Tanya and I'm a youth services librarian. Awesome. Um, if you would like to get a list of all of the books that we have, we'll be talking about this evening, um, you can get that link in the description below and um, they should all be available to reserve through the library's website and we will get started. I will share my screen first, step one. And we will start with Allison. Okay, my first book is What Storm, What Thunder by Miriam Chancey. This is set in Haiti after the 2010 earthquake which devastated that country and which is still affecting that country today. It follows several characters from all walks of life, but no matter what your wealth or station, what was going on in your life, the earthquake made it a level playing field for everyone. It destroyed everything in its path. We learned what happens after the disaster and how it changes their lives. It is heartbreaking, but it is also about resilience and strength. And I felt like I knew so much more about Haiti after reading this novel. Yeah. My first recommendation is The Woman All Spies Fear, a nonfiction biography. Um, the subtitle is Codebreaker Elizabeth Smith Friedman and Her Hidden Life. This is technically a YA biography, but it is so fascinating. I read it in one sitting. I couldn't put it down. Um, and I had never heard of Elizabeth Smith Frieden, Friedman before I read this book. Um, probably most people had not because she had been intentionally erased and most of her work was classified um, until her, after her death. She worked for the Coast Guard and other government organizations throughout World War I and World War II and then later into the Cold War as a code breaker. And the NSA basically locked all of the files about the work that she and her husband, who also worked for the NSA, um, did throughout their life. They seized their library and their personal writings and just basically didn't allow them to ever talk about the work that they did. She worked on everything from decoding Shakespeare's first folio to um, the Enigma machine in World War II and much, uh, much many other things later on. Um, she was a fascinating woman and I learned so much. When the World Runs Dry is a nonfiction, and I would say this is for fifth, sixth grade and up, including adults, uh, that it talks about several reasons why the world is running low on clean water supply. Uh, there's some things that are being pumped into the water supply, whether it's through the grass, uh, going into the natural water below, uh, or many other reasons that it talks about that cannot be filtered out. And one of my favorite parts about this nonfiction is they use examples to explain each one and how it is causing it. So some are more well-known like in Flint, Michigan, the water crisis that came up um, or in light, it was happening well before 2014. Um, but when that started being in the news, some are more local and more recent, including in Greeley, Colorado, when they had, um, they had fracking too close to an elementary school and how laws changed that. So I highly recommend this for any age, whether you're curious about finding out about water or what we can do to help as well. There's lots of uh, partnering with organization ideas or ideas, small things that add up um, that were listed as well. So it's a really powerful look at what we can do and what has happened with our water. Ah, the Island of Missing Trees. This book starts as a forbidden love story between Costas, a Greek, and Daphne of Turkish, back, Turkish background on Cyprus, but it soon includes so much more. The taverna where they meet surreptitiously is overseen by a fig tree. When they flee the violence in Cyprus and move to England, Costas takes a cutting 
and the resulting very wise fig tree continues to provide part of the narration in the book. Later, their daughter Ada's school assignment is to draw her family tree, which is hard for her as her parents have never talked much about their family back in Cyprus. Her Cypriot aunt visits and shares family stories. This is a beautiful book about identity, family, and other trees, and home. Can you go back to a home where you have never been? And you will love the fig tree. Okay, this is Reckless Girls by Rachel Hawkins. Um, this is an adult book. It's by the author of The Wife Upstairs, and it's good for those of you that like mysteries and thrillers. Uh, the main character's name is Lux, and Lux um, is living with her boyfriend in Hawaii, and Lux is pretty tired of being stationary. She is looking for an opportunity to travel, and so she's really excited when her boyfriend, Nico, is hired to um, take these two college girls on a boating trip. They want to go check out Moreau Island, which is in the middle of nowhere in the Pacific. Um, it's not a destination spot, and they want to go off the beaten path and just be by themselves. The four um, quickly become friends, and they're excited for a few days by themselves, but when they get to the island, there are already two other people there, Jake and Eliza. Um, everything is going well. The, they all start to become friends and are hanging out and just living the island life, um, but all of a sudden, a very mysterious and kind of scary a stranger shows up somebody goes missing and then another person turns up dead um, and now this island that was paradise is tur quickly turning into something that everybody needs to escape from so if you like a good mystery check out reckless girls okay this is index a history of by dennis duncan um, and i did read that are that title correctly history index a history of because this is actually that a history of indexes this one is for the book nerds out there you know who you are um, it goes from the earliest attempt to make biblical concordances to up to indexing information on the internet it's really well researched but it is also approachable and funny um, he includes examples of bad indexes, wrong indexes, even spiteful ones with entries such as butchers to be avoided, or Calvin in his chamber with a nun. I don't know what that one's from. I, I'm kind of curious. I don't remember that one. But um, you, you'll often hear me say, oh, you need to do this as an audiobook, but not this time. Please don't do the audiobook. No offense to the narrator, but there's a lot of examples of indexes and he, the narrator has to read them all. And um, I highly recommend the book. Um, get the book and enjoy 800 years of us learning how to search for information. Okay. My Fine Fellow, if you are a fan of My Fair Lady, My Fine Fellow is a gender swapped retelling of My Fair Lady with food. It was delightful. It was so good. Um, you meet the familiar characters in the story. Like I said, it's gender swapped. So you meet Helena, who is Henry Higgins personified, right down to being a little bit unlikable <laughs> through most of the story. Um, she and her best friend Penelope, who is a mixed race, um, half Filipina, half English um, woman, are part of the Culinarian Society, which is fictitious. It doesn't exist in the real world. But in the 1830s in England that they have imagined here, they are part of this Culinarian group who are training to be elite cookers <laughs> um, and to impress the queen. And they come across Elijah Little, who is the Eliza Doolittle character, um, selling empanadas in the street and decide that they can turn him into a professional chef. Um, and hilarity ensues from there. It's a sweet romance. Um, it has, it does also de delve into some heavier topics, talking about what it was like at that time in England to be mixed uh, biracial or Jewish. And so if you are looking for a slightly lighter story that is just a really fun and familiar, highly recommend My Fine Fellow. 
Catherine, is that a teen book or? Yes, I mean, <laughs> yes. <it is>. Like, <laughs> I still want it also, but I just wondered. Okay. It is a teen book, yes. I Don't Gossip is another teen book. It's realistic. I would say it's for seventh grade and up. And it's really about chasing dreams and finding where you belong in a group. In this book, it's specifically in a K-pop group. Alice wants to be a singer. She loves singing. She goes to training all the time, voice training. Uh, but after she moves, she's still trying to find a voice trainer, but loves karaoke with her sister. That's kind of her outlet in this new place where they're living now. And after one session of karaoke, she's offered a business card by someone who actually is a K-pop scout. She looks all over for talent for K-pop groups and feels Alice would be a perfect fit. So with much convincing of her parents, she does end up joining and it's like a dorm kind of building with all the different K-pop groups. She's learning from everyone, trying to figure out where she belongs. She knows that her voice is worthy enough, but she has a lot of catching up to do with the culture, with the dance styles, and there's gossip bloggers that are writing about her specifically since she joined so late, even though they haven't come out as a group yet. So it's a really interesting kind of dynamic between the different groups and how do you process gossip bloggers? Because most of it's not true. They don't know you. It's only what they've seen or they're trying to get readers, right? So it's a great conversation about finding herself and kind of putting that to the side. So if you want a really good realistic story, if you're interested about K-pop, it shows a different side of K-pop than is talked about. Uh, this, uh, the Summer Place by Jennifer Weiner is my summer or beach read suggestion. This will be published in May, but you can put it on hold now through our website. It's for people who love to get lost in family stories. 22-year-old Ruby, Sarah's stepdaughter, has announced that she and her pandemic boyfriend Gabe are getting married. And the wedding will be at the family home on Cape Cod, of course. Even though Sarah and her husband Eli feel Ruby is too young, the planning is underway and off they go to the Cape. This naturally brings the extended family together, many of whom are hiding secrets which will impact the lives of the others if revealed. Why is Grandma Ronnie so worried about the DNA test for her children? Can Uncle Sam find another love after the death of his wife? Will Sarah and Eli's marriage survive after Ruby's mother, Sam, um, Eli's first wife, who's been missing for quite a while, appears on the scene? Jennifer Weiner knows how to bring her characters to life. You will care what happens to each one after their secrets and lies are out in the open. I'll be putting that on hold, Pamela. Oh. <laughs> um, sounds like a great beach read. Um, this next one is An Unwanted Guest by Sherry Lapina. Uh, this is also an adult book and um, by the author of The Couple Next Door, another good thriller, um, intense mystery. It's um, kind of told in different perspectives um, from guests who are all going on a weekend retreat kind of getaway in the Catskill Mountains. They're all staying at an inn um, and everybody was excited but they weren't expecting a huge winter storm to roll through. The storm is so bad that the inn loses electricity and heat and everybody is just stuck there which is going well until one of the guests um, turns up dead. Uh, it looks like an accident and uh, every, everybody's not panicking yet until a second guest um, shows up dead. And now they're wondering, is it one of the other guests who is going around killing people? Or is there a person that's hiding in this inn that they don't know about? Um, this one was good. I did not expect the ending or guess who the killer was. So if you like murder mysteries, this is a good one for you. Hey, this is Honor by Threddy Umregar. Um, I'm going to warn you right now, this one will rip your heart out. Um, so that's, you might know Umregar from The Space Between Us and The Secrets Between Us. Also heartbreaking books. Um, thank you, Ms. Umregar. You, you're really good at that. In this one, we have Mina, who is a poor Hindu woman in India who married a Muslim man, very much against her family and her whole village's objections. 
Her family later kills her husband, and then her brothers are put on trial for his murder. Smita, the other main character, is an Indian American journalist, and she's sent to India to cover the story um, and to cover the trial and really gets involved in Mina's story and life. It's a study in the contrast between these two women and the choices that are available to them based on their caste, their religion, their home country, their education. Um, and you will get immersed in both their stories and in their lives. If your book club can handle a rip your heart out book, this would be a perfect choice for book clubs. Why is My Memory Told Me by Sasha Wuntz is um, a psychological thriller with a sci-fi twist, if you like those. It is YA, um, but I do think adult readers will enjoy it. Um, it is set in a world that is pretty much our own, except for there is this new technology called Enhanced Memories. Um, and it works a lot like virtual reality, but goes one step further to actually implanting the memories of other people on top of your own. You can kind of see where the title is going. Um, because it becomes harder and harder to distinguish what you actually remember doing and what is an implant, an enhanced memory from someone else. Um, the main character of the story is Nova, whose parents actually invented enhanced memory. And lately they have been more and more dense, distance distant, clearly spending most of their time in the enhanced memory world um, to the point where they don't seem to notice or remember her. She is also starting to have these weird pains and flashes anytime that she tries to reach for a memory that perhaps she shouldn't. Um, and so she is starting to question what is going on, what happened. This one has so many excellent twists and turns. You will, it will keep you guessing until the end. Final Moon uh, is a realistic, I'd say, for upper eighth grade um, and up, and it is multi-format. There's poems, conversations. The chapters are shorter since they're more based on the conversation. And I will start with a content warning that there is discussion of partner violence, both physical and emotional. Um, so if that bothers you, you might want to skip this one. But this is about Angel, and she is moving to live with her uncle after being in an abusive relationship. She is both recovering physically on the outside, her arm is in a sling, um, and she has several bruises that she's trying to come up with answers when people ask her about them, to on the inside where she thinks it was all her fault and she's really trying to process. And she has been identified to join this group called HER. Um, it's a really awesome class, it's almost like a homeroom study, uh, but HER stands for her excellence and resilience or honoring everyone's roots. And the teacher does a really good job about checking in with each other's emotions, which at first Angel isn't used to. She doesn't get asked at home um, with her, her mother previously what is going on with her. So she's slowly warming up to the group and realizing this is really helpful. They bring in music to share with each other and they just make all these different connections and she's starting to get back in the rhythm of herself and finding where she was before, if not growing even more. Uh, so if you like a really good deep story, I highly recommend Vinyl Moon. How High We Go in the Dark by Sequoia Nagamatsu is a very imaginative book made up of intricate stories which slowly reveal the interconnectedness of everything on Earth or even in the universe. The author of this book of speculative fiction or science fiction imagined the structure of this book a decade ago and she started with wondering what would happen if a plague was unleashed on the world. This particular pandemic was un uncovered in the Arctic. Who knew what would actually be happening here on Earth eight years after she started imagining this book? The stories introduce people who attempt to cope with their new reality in various ways. One of my favorites was the scientist who created a talking pig while working on organ transplants. In another, a widowed painter and her teenage daughter embark on a cosmic quest to locate a new home on a faraway planet to get away. If you want to read escapist books with happy endings, I'm afraid this is not for you, 
But if, like me, you really enjoyed Station Eleven by Emily St. John Mandel, I think you'll like this, and I hope you'll give it a chance. I, I really loved it also. Thank you, Allison. Yes. Yeah, give it a try. All right, this um, is the last Quintista. Um, this won the Newbery Medal this year for um, kids literature, and I really enjoyed it. It's kind of a dystopian science fiction novel, and it's about a girl named Petra. Petra is living in a future where Earth is about to end. Um, Earth is going to be destroyed by a comet, and only a lucky um, few hundred people are getting the chance to get off Earth and um, um, go on a spaceship, take a 300-year ride, and get to another planet. Um, Petra's family is one of them because her parents, her parents are important scientists. Um, they get on this this ship and they're being put to sleep in these pods and they'll wake up 300 years later. Except when Petra is being put to sleep, it doesn't go as planned, um, but nobody knows it but her. Petra doesn't go fully to sleep. She's very aware of her surroundings um, and what's going on. She can hear people talking and Petra starts to panic. How is she going to survive a 300 year journey if she's awake? Um, also, she can hear people kind of fighting and panicking and yelling, and it seems like things are maybe not going the way um, as planned on this ship. There is a pretty big twist in this story that I didn't see coming and really enjoyed. So if you like sci-fi or dystopian, I thought this was great even for adults, um, but otherwise I would say higher fourth grade end up for this one. So that's the last Quintista. I don't always agree with award winners, but this one definitely deserved every award that it has won. Agreed. And I will second the good for adults part. Okay, Under Lock and Skeleton Key by Gigi Pandian. Um, this just came out in March and it's a mystery. Tempest Raj is a successful Las Vegas magician when an incident that we never really find out about, on, an incident on stage derails her career. She returns home to help manage her parents' construction company. And you think, oh, that sounds so dull after a career as a magician. However, this is no ordinary construction company. They build hidden rooms, sliding bookcases, secret stairways um, for their very wealthy clients, um, magical tree houses for kids that they can get to from their bedroom, probably every parent's nightmare there. But while they're working on one of these projects, Tempest's former stage double is found murdered in one of the rooms. So this is the ultimate locked room mystery because the, no one even knows the room exists, let alone is able to get in or out. Um, and if it's her body double, was Tempest really the target or was Tempest the murderer? We don't know. If you like mysteries with great characters, a family with a history of curses and just a touch of magic, this is for you. It was a lot of fun. I'm and I want to redo that. my house. <laughs> my house has an appalling lack of hidden staircases and things. So, Sounds a lot of fun. I will definitely put that on home. Band Book Club by Kim Hyun Suk is nonfiction. It is also a graphic novel. It's technically YA, but the main character is in college. Um, and it is a memoir um, of Hyun Suk's time at in college in the 1980s in South Korea. I learned so much about South Korea at this time. Shamefully, my knowledge of South Korea basically was that we had the Korean War <laughs> at some point in the 1950s and 60s. I didn't know much beyond that about the history of the government there or anything. Um, and so she talks about her experience going to college under the Fifth, um, the Fifth Republic, which was a militaristic regime that controlled the people through censorship and um, torture and murdering and putting people in prison. And so I think so often in history, at least in the United States, the focus is on North Korea, um, that we don't always think about what has, was happening in South Korea at the time. Um, she talks about um, her experience starting college and being introduced to other student protesters because students really did lead the majority of the protest movements. 
Um, my heads up is that this one is pretty hard to read. There's torture on the page by the police, but it's also very timely in a, a political climate where books are being banned daily in the United States as well. Prada and Jai's recipe for romance is definitely romance and it is realistic. I would say it's for seventh grade and up. And Radha is amazing at classical Indian dance. It's her passion. It's what she's been doing for years through competitions. And during one competition, she starts to overhear rumors that her mother has been swaying judges. And they do talk about how good she is at dancing, but they also talk about what happens when she's up there with her mother um, kind of swaying the judges or they feel that she's swaying them. So Radha starts to question if she's doing it for her, if she's doing it more for her mother, dancing in competitions, especially not necessarily dance. And so she's decided to back out of the next competition and kind of refocus on herself. Through this, she starts cooking. Her father is a chef and gives her one of their family recipe books. She starts attending a different school where she meets Jai, who is one of the leads in the Bollywood dance team at their school. And she starts to see a whole different side of passion for dancing and is interested in choreographing a routine with this Bollywood team as well. Uh, Jai has convinced her that the traditional aspect of dance would be perfect to include it as well. And it really could be a powerful mix, both the dance and Radha and Jai as they start talking to each other. It is such a fun book about finding yourself, finding where you belong and not belonging somewhere just for others, but because it's your passion. And I highly encourage a snack with this. Her cooking sounds phenomenal. That's Radha and Jai's recipe for romance. The Murder Rule um, is by Derv Dervla McTiernan, one of my favorite mystery authors. If you like Tana French's mysteries set in Ireland, you will like McTiernan's Cormac Riley series, which is also Ireland based. This one, The Murder Rule, is a standalone and it is set in Virginia, not Ireland. In it, uh, Professor Rob Perek runs the Innocence Project at the University of Virginia. Law students work for it to find evidence to clear imprisoned people they believe have been wrongly convicted. Our main character, Hannah Rokeby, travels from Maine and talks her way into being hired to work on one of the cases of the Innocence Project in Virginia. But as the publisher's blurb says, they think I'm here to save an innocent man on death row. They're wrong. I'm going to bury him. But why? What is Hannah's relationship? to this case what is her relationship with her mother that's cheering her on from back home in maine how will she be able to work against the other team members who of course are working to clear this fellow in in prison i had a very hard time putting this one down as the secrets and lies and twists kept coming This is Across the Desert by Dusty Bowling. Um, I was really excited for this book because I loved The Canyon's Edge, and this one is just as good. Trigger warnings do include depression and then some pill drug abuse. It's about a girl named Jolene, and Jolene loves going to the library every day so that she can watch um, her favorite person, Addie Earhart. Um, on kind of like this on YouTube, a live stream. Uh, Addie Earhart is a 12 year old girl who flies her own ultralight plane all around the desert and Jolene loves watching her. But one day while Jolene is watching and tuning in, Addie crashes um, somewhere in the desert. Uh, the camera goes blank and Jolene can hear Addie scream. Jolene doesn't know this person in real life, um, but she starts to panic. She asks all of the adults in her life, her mom um, who has depression, uh, she asks the cops if she can go find this girl. And everybody says that this girl isn't real, it's just something she saw on the internet. Jolene knows that this is in her heart that this isn't true. And so she decides to set out um, by herself to go find Addie Earhart in the middle of the Arizona desert. Uh, keep in mind that it's hot and Jolene is not prepared. She does not pack enough supplies. 
She does make um, one friend who kind of starts to help her, but this will be a journey and an adventure of a lifetime. So this book will keep you on the edge of your seat. Um, you just want her to find Addie that is across the desert. Okay, this is The Cartographers by Peng Shepherd. Um, this is another one that is just being published in March. If you like a few genres all at once, this is for you. This is a mystery. It's literary fiction, a little bit of speculative fiction. It feels historical at times, but also futuristic. Nell has always wanted to be a cartographer working with precious historical maps like her parents before her and is on track with that with all the correct graduate degrees and a prestigious job at New York Public Library's map division. But then why does her father destroy her career and get her fired when she just accidentally mentions and finds a cheap old road map, the kind they used to just give away at gas stations? Um, later, her father is found dead in his office, and he still has that old road map hidden in his drawer. Why is that map so valuable? What is it hiding? Or what is it giving directions to? Um, it, this goes back and forth from these historic maps to 1930s road maps to Google Maps, except it's not Google, it's a different evil company in this book. Um, I just finished this about an hour ago and my mind is still buzzing. You should let your mind get buzzing also, especially all the way through the author's notes at the end, which reveal something even more surprising than the book. That's an excellent cliffhanger. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Okay, The Reckless Kind by Carly Heath is historical fiction. Technically, it's set in 1904 Norway, uh, which is a slightly different setting than normal. It is a YA book, um, but at its heart, this book is about the characters in the story. Um, it's a bit of a slow burn, I will say, so don't give up on it. <laughs> it does pick up as you get to know the characters, um, but you meet Asta Hedstrom, Gunnar Fuglista and Erland Fournier, who are three teens who have grown up putting on plays in the theater. So there's a lot of Shakespeare and other things happening um, that each of them has to sort of defy the expectations of their parents and find their own path. Asta's parents have decided that it is time for her to marry and they have found her a fiance. Um, and what you learn throughout the story is that even though the language wasn't there at the time, Asta is non-binary, asexual, and aromantic, um, and does not ever want to marry, um, doesn't even fully feel like a girl. Um, and she wants more than anything to build this friend and family unit with Gunnar and Erlan, who are two young gay men who are trying to figure out how to defy their parents' expectations, and truly um, that of the entire society where it was basically illegal for them to be with one another throughout the story. The story kind of centers around this horse race that happens, but like I said, it is truly more a story of found family and of the characters as you get to know them. I will give a couple of content warnings for depression, homophobia, and some suicide ideation in the story. Walking in Two Worlds is realistic with fantasy elements uh, as it's being told in our world and part of a virtual world as well that is created by users, kind of think of Ready Player One type. Um, I'd say this one's for eighth grade and up, and there's a content warning that there is self-harm cutting in particular that's discussed in part of this book, um, as well as bullying. There is a bit of bullying as well. Uh, but it follows bugs and she is navigating between these two worlds she lives in in her day-to-day -day life uh, she's very so shy and very self-conscious she's always kind of aware that people seem to be watching her um, and judging her because she's always wanting to do more for her family they live on the reservation and she her brother is older and seen as the one that's going to carry through with different family things but they're working through some really difficult news about his health. And she's just wanting to stay connected with her older brother and try to figure out how to take charge of the family as well. While in the uh, Floraverse, as it's called, uh, she's a very strong, powerful woman. She is kind of 
popular. She's very almost idealized. People really uh, connect with her. And she has this area that she's created to preserve her indigenous culture. She really has brought a lot into this metaverse um, that they live in, the Floriverse. And so it's a really interesting how she is trying to be both people um, or have the kind of the metaverse person come into her real life, have that confidence and power as she is trying to fight bullies. There's a group in the Floriverse called Clanless that really kind of teams up against her. And she's meeting this guy, Fang, who is a classmate from China who just moved in with his aunt on the res, kind of navigating both sides of the Floriverse and uh, in, in person as well. And what can they do to help each other to kind of even it out? Um, it's a really interesting look at both sides. So that's walking in two worlds. The Saints of Swallow Hill by Donna Everhart is my full-fledged historical fiction entry, a good choice for book clubs and other readers who like to learn about parts of our history that are not often talked about or known of. It's also for those who enjoy a Southern setting. Uh, this one is set in Depression era, Georgia and North Carolina in the turpentine camps amongst the pine forests. This is why North Carolina became known as the Tar Heel State. The story focuses on Ray Lynn, an orphan with no family, who passes as a man named Ray to work at the Swallow Hill Turpentine Camp. It also focuses on Delwood Reese, who has come to Swallow Hill to get away from his past misdeeds and who tries to protect Ray once he figures out her secret. And also on Cornelia, who is the browbeaten wife of the commissary owner and the camp. Uh, if they want to find a way out of life in the camp, all three will have to come to terms with their past as they move forward. This is deeply felt historical fiction, somewhat dark in places, but with very relatable and real characters grappling with life during this very hard time in the South. All right, this is Ain't Burned All the Bright by Jason Reynolds and Jason Griffin as the illustrator. Um, this book is very unique, a little bit hard to describe unless you can pick it up and look at it. Um, but basically, it's about 300 pages full of kind of collage like art. And I think it's only three very long sentences that um, portrays what it was like or what it is like to be black in America during the pandemic. Um, so it's hopeful, but sad. Um, it's very eye opening, but also very um, could be very relatable as well. So I know there is an audio book of this one as well, but I would highly suggest um, that you pick this one up and look at it. The art is amazing um, and it's very touching. It's one of those books that will stay with you long after you read it. So that's just a quick description because I don't feel like there's any good way to describe it, but that is Ain't Burned All the Bright. I think Jason Reynolds can do no wrong in terms of books, so um, I love all the styles that he has. Okay, those are all of the books that we have for you this month. We hope that one or two maybe have tempted you to play some holds. Um, we will be back in the end of May and June for some summer reading book parties. We're excited to share some summer reads with you, so look for us then. Have a good evening.